Hello and welcome to Great Biographies of Bakersfield, a unique opportunity to meet the leading citizens of our city at close range, to get to know them, to hear from them, to draw upon their life lessons for our own lives. And the leader with us in this edition is none other than the Honorable Harvey Hall, the mayor of our city, now serving his second term, a business leader, a civic leader, and a political leader. Harvey Hall, welcome to Great Biographies of Bakersfield. Well, thank you very much for affording me this opportunity. Harvey, I so look forward to, to this uh, particular segment because you are so known as a public man, but I think there's so much about you that people don't know, and this is kind of our opportunity to do that. There's an old saying in journalism that if you want to understand the true nature of anything, take it back to its origins. And that's what I'd like to do with you, starting out. Uh, we now know you as an eminent leader and, and uh, influential citizen of our city. But take us back to the early influences that, that shaped you. Take us back to your boyhood. Where did you grow up? And tell us about your family. Well, I grew up in, in Bakersfield. I came here from Dumas, Texas. Uh, when I was one year old and uh, spent the rest of my life here and uh, uh, I'm an only child and uh, I'm adopted and uh, my, my parents are probably the foundation of my whole life because of the way that they uh, encouraged me to uh, in my early years behave and act like a good citizen and, and to have uh, uh, a high degree of integrity and we were very active in the First Methodist Church at the time and and uh, I even sang in the choir with my parents back then and um, it, uh, it it was a good childhood experience for me only because my, my parents were good at creating values and, and I always respected them for the life that they provided our family and, and uh, uh, how we didn't uh, have much. My father was a petroleum engineer and uh, uh, was responsible for managing uh, uh, oil leases in the McKittrick area. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, he lived, his mo uh, my mom and he lived uh, on the lease in McKittrick for a while. And uh, it was, um, <clears throat> It was a great experience growing up uh, with my parents and growing up in this community. And of course, as I say, that if you stay in a community as long as I've been here, then you're going to have the benefit of all those years of growth and all those good, good years of, of giving. Tell us how your mother and your father instilled those values in you. What, what life experiences did they use to inculcate what, uh, the, the core values that shaped you? I think that um, you know it was just the the pure and, and right and wrong, and uh, the fact that uh, you you obeyed your parents. Uh, as I indicated, the the church was a big part of of our lives, um, and and my my parents were both uh, very affectionate people, and so we were able to to build a bond and. And as I grew up, that affection just uh, remained. And, and uh, uh, my parents were always uh, uh, great people for reaching out to their friends and, and to my young friends to, to welcome people into our home. And we didn't have a lot. We didn't have a lot. And, and, uh, but my dad worked very hard. And uh, uh, we, uh, our first residence uh, was at uh, a... Um, a motel, if you will, on, on Union Avenue where the icebox was one of those old timers where you put the, the, the cue or the big uh, ice block in your refrigerator to keep it cold and, and then right across the street was the Carnation Creamery. And uh, that's uh, how we started our life in Bakersfield and then we moved to East Bakersfield and, and then uh, we moved to the Southwest. Well, uh, I use Southwest now, but it was South Bakersfield then. <laughs> and uh, from there, we moved up to the uh, Northeast area in College Heights by the college. And uh, uh, then it was pretty much time to, for, for me to leave the roost by then and, and, and go on my own. For some uh, 
uh, Harvey, the experience of adoption is a scarring experience in their life. They feel they're starting with a disadvantage. <clears throat> that didn't work out for you that way, did it? So what would you say to those adopted children uh, of by way of encouragement? Well, my experience was such that uh, my mother, uh, until I was 12 years old, grieved about the day in which she was going to have to inform me that, that I was adopted. And finally, when that day came, I just looked her in the eye and said, you are my mom and dad is my dad and that's all I'll ever know and that's all I care to know. Uh, I've never had any desire to uh, find my uh, natural parents because I, I only believe in, in, in my parents and how wonderful they were and that's all I care to remember. Harvey, in your youth, uh, tell us about uh, youthful hobbies, things that really got your attention and, and uh, got you involved, things that uh, fascinated you as a boy. Well, I, uh, um, when, when we uh, moved to our residence in East Bakersfield, uh, I lived next door to a fellow that used to uh, uh, build floats in the community and, and uh, mm -hmm. I would uh, participate in the animation on those floats whenever there were parades here in Bakersfield. And I'll never forget one year, uh, he built a, fl a float on my bicycle and we, we used to have an annual bicycle parade and would run from the Baker Street Library to Jastrow Park. And so uh, they built a, a float on my bike and, and uh, the, the theme was the safer you ride, you'll save your hide. <laughs> and so uh, we, uh, uh, we got by the, just as we got by the judging stand at, at Truxton Avenue there in Chester, I lost control of my bike, <laughs> but it had already been judged. And so then when we got to uh, uh, Jastrow Park, I won the top prize for the, the most beautiful bike float. And, and so I used to, to play around with bikes and, and uh, you know, and the, the same little thing that a lot of kids go through with little cars and different things like that and building up little play tracks in the, in, in the back of our our home and then uh, Little League Baseball was a big thing for me. I, I grew up with the Junior Baseball Association when it started its very first day at uh, 4th and P Streets there and and uh, my dad was always very supportive and helped me and set up a pitching mound in the front yard of our home so I could uh, learn how to pitch and, and uh, uh, baseball was always a big thing. I, I tell people all the time that when as I was growing up I used to be a bat boy at the Bakersfield Indians in 1948 and, and uh, I just used uh, that as kind of a entry into professional baseball and, and I've enjoyed it ever since. Um, you know, I, one of my uh, childhood heroes was Howdy Doody and I have a, a collection of Howdy Doody memorabilia and the string puppets and videotapes and everything else and, and uh, uh, every once in a while when I'm having a bad day I'll bring out one of the videos just to see old time television and see all the joy and happiness that was brought to the children and the audience by Howdy Doody and Buffalo Bob and, and Clarabelle and all those uh, characters in that, in that uh, comedy and, and children's series. What do you think, uh, from your own experience, Harvey, the value of athletics, getting involved in athletics, is for the shaping of character and the lessons that stay with you through the rest of your life from just uh, being out in those ball fields and playing ball? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, athletics uh, can uh, be the cornerstone of, of, of life, as far as I'm concerned. When you're growing up and, and um, you need to create a foundation for yourself, you can do that through athletics. You can do that by creating friendships, uh, character, uh, teamwork. As you know, a, a big thing about athletics is teamwork and working with each other. And it, it teaches you to uh, respect authority because you have coaches and you have uh, leaders in athletics that, that help you uh, develop. And, and it's, a, it's an appreciation for people as well. You know, and, and being able to take athletics and, and help others. You know, reaching out to young children uh, as I was growing up and as I got to be a, a better baseball player, I, I would go in through the neighborhoods and, and help the kids and, and teach them how to hold a bat and how to throw a baseball. And, you know, that was uh, 
probably a good beginning of, of my community service at the time. I, I would have not thought of it that way mm -hmm. then, but giving back to others and being a part of, of something positive. And I, I think you can do that with athletics. I think that it, it gives you a level of maturity as well. Um, the challenges, the challenges of succeeding, the challenges of, of winning, but most importantly, knowing how to tolerate when you don't win and how to bring that experience back to you and learn from that in a positive way and how you can meet or exceed that challenge the next time. Harvey, you spoke of that point in your life where it came time to fly the nest, uh, to leave that loving, nurturing home that your mother and father provided for you. Tell us about that break and uh, once you're out on your own, then what? Well, believe it or not, um, that break uh, came with my entry uh, into my ambulance career. And I was working at the time as a hospital orderly at Mercy Hospital, and I was living with my parents. And, and I uh, had to catch the bus at 19th and Chester every day to go home because I didn't own a car. And uh, so this one day I, I went to take the bus and I ran into a friend. Uh, Danny Tinsley and uh, you know when you haven't seen someone for a while you'll say well Danny what are you doing now and he said well I'm driving an ambulance for Valley Ambulance and I said well you're doing what who would want to do that job And he says no he says man it's a hoot he says I dare you to drive come down tonight and take a ride along with me and we'll run all over town with the red light and siren and I said oh no I don't think so that's that's not for me and he says, well, think it over, man, and, and give me a call back. So then I went home, and, and uh, I spoke with my mom at the time, and, and uh, she said, well, listen, you're only going to do some ride-along, so why don't you go and, and, and try it? Maybe you'll enjoy it. And I thought some more, and I said, okay, well, I'll go and try it. So that evening I rode from 5 to 2 in the morning, and um, uh, I enjoyed it. We didn't run all over town with the red light and siren. We did... Uh, uh, transport uh, several patients, but the next morning the manager of the ambulance company called me and said, uh, Harvey, would you like to have a job as an ambulance attendant? And I said, yeah, I think I, I would, and that was 44 years ago. And so you can say that I left the nest on a dare to ride in an ambulance. And so after that, then I ended up uh, working uh, six and a half days a week, uh, 24 hours a day for a long time, so that's how I left the nest. And Harvey, what was it about? I mean, that's a that's a tough job schedule. What was it about that job that just kept drawing you deeper and deeper into that particular form of enterprise? Well, to begin with, we wore white uniforms, and in in, in those days, white uniforms meant that everything was nice and neat and clean and. And uh, nurses uh, wore white uniforms and hats, and and it was a, a big fa big thing about the medical profession, and most importantly to me, uh, in in the developing of my career uh, in the ambulance business was the ability to care for others. Uh, people would ask me, you know, how how can you uh, tolerate that kind of job? And I would tell them that. Each one of the calls would be a challenge to me, and then I would work hard to learn the best I could with my skills, to, to do the best treatment and care that I could provide. But the thing that, that bothered me the most until I stopped uh, uh, providing service in the field was the emotional uh, hardships that took place uh, after an incident, after an illness, after a death. Uh, those kind of things affected me uh, tremendously, and it kept me motivating myself to constantly give back to people and to care about people. And that's that's why the ambulance business has been so good for me. It, it's kind of a an extension of my my parents caring for me, and then me being able to to give back to people and give back to the community. You hear so many employers in so many different kinds of businesses say it's very difficult to instill the the uh, creator's vision into those people who work for you. And yet, how have you been able to pass on your life purpose of caring for people and using this particular profession to provide care for people? How do you instill that in all of those who work for you and now drive all your ambulance, ambulances all over this city? 
You know, it's uh, the, the passion that I have today for the business is the same passion that I had uh, nearly 35 years ago when I started Hall Ambulance. Uh, I can remember uh, once upon a time when I was uh, washing an ambulance uh, the, the day that um, President Kennedy was uh, shot and the manager came out and I was devastated. The manager came out and, and told me uh, what had happened. But at the same time, he, t he told me that um, there are two sides to every piece of glass because I only knew cleaning the windshield on one side. And so from that, then I have taught that through my people that there's two sides to every glass. My expectation every day is perfection. Reality is, no, that can't happen. But as long as you have the passion and as long as you have the the commitment, um, I use another word of, of conscientiousness, then you can uh, convey to your employees how you want it done and they'll go out and perform. I'm very proud of the nearly 350 employees that I have now, uh, that they work very hard every day to meet or exceed my expectations. And, and a lot of that is evidenced by nearly 50% of my employees have been with me five years or more. So I, I'm very proud of that. I mean, so many people uh, become excellent in their professions in terms of being an employee, but making that break and making the decision to say, I want my own business in this field. How did that, uh, how did that decision take shape for you? I had spent um, uh, 10 years uh, working uh, for uh, the other ambulance company in town and uh, serving at all capacities and, and the last five were of ambulance management and I had gotten to a point where I felt like that there were things that were needed to enhance the business. For instance, we needed newer ambulances. I wanted multiple locations in the city for response purposes. Uh, I wanted the building painted. I, I wanted the lot paved, okay, because I felt at the time that it was important for us to show value if people were gonna pay for our services, then I wanted them to, to, to be able to feel that, that value that we put it back in the business. And the owner at the time didn't feel that way. And uh, so um, he and I disagreed on what I thought was best and, and um, uh, I attempted to purchase the business, but then on the day that we had agreed that we would uh, consummate our agreement, then he decided that it was worth $50,000 more and I had told him two weeks before that, if you raise the price, then, then I'm done. And so he did, so I left and, and then uh, that was in December. And then in February of 1971, I decided to start my own business. And the purpose of doing that was to be able to give back to the community and to be able to have the opportunity to have new ambulances, to have multiple stations in town, be able to provide a higher level of care, be able to give better equipment, and be able to justify the, the cost of an ambulance call. Harvey, it's one thing to be even a high executive in somebody else's company when it, when it is on your shoulders. And, but then to take that next step where suddenly it all rests on you, was there ever a point where you, you know, did a big, took a big gulp and said, I think maybe I've bitten off more than I can chew? Uh, uh, tell us about stepping into that true leadership role. Well, that was never a question for me because I was so happy to be there and to be in that role uh, that... Now today, if someone were to ask me that question, I might have a different answer. But back then, in, in, in my early beginnings uh, of, of working uh, uh, six days a week, 24 hours a day, and running every first ambulance call, I was just happy to be there. I was happy to, to be able to uh, have my ambulance parked at the curb and, and call on a a local physician and sit in his office for an hour, an hour and a half just to be able to come in and say, hi, I'm Harvey Hall and I've got a new ambulance service in town and if you have a, a need for our service, I'd appreciate a call. I, I, I to, that, to that moment, from the first time that I ran my first call at the Rancho Bakersfield Motel on Golden State Avenue 35 years ago, you know, it, it's just always been good for me and, and the community 
the community through the years has been very, very good to me, which has caused me to be able to, to give back and, and to, to have the ongoing enthusiasm about my business. Very important phrase popped out there, Harvey. Why, why might there be a, a different answer today if, uh, if you were facing the same question? There, there is a, a, an enormous uh, amount of um, work that has to go into running a, a business of, of size today with the, with the amount of government regulations, the uh, constant uh, challenges that we have for reimbursement for our services. Um, the employee of today is certainly different uh, than they were so many years ago. Uh, I never would have thought that a time would come when I would have to have a full-time human resources director with my company, but today I do. And that's, that's necessary so that we can give the uh, employee services that, that are needed for the employee of today. Um, the public, uh, the public uh, requires uh, a lot more of business today and there's a lot more demand uh, for quality service. Uh, there's a lot more demand to be able to justify um, the, the, the charges that you generate. Um, the, the, the issue of um, medical justification uh, to have your claims paid by uh, insurance companies and managed, pair, uh, managed care organizations that, that's a challenge. I mean, I can remember uh, 30 years ago when I bought my first computer billing system and was told, well, the computer will replace people uh, and you won't need as many people and that's how you're going to pay for it. Well, today I have 25 billing clerks uh, and it has, the, re the computers have not replaced uh, people because the people have to process because we, we just do not have the the cooperation on the other side. Harvey, for those young people who may be watching this now, what do you look for, most look for, when you go to hire new employees, young employees coming into the business? Well, I think uh, initially they must uh, appear for their uh, job interview looking like they want a job. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in how you appear and how you present yourself initially. Now, in our business, You've got to have a sensitivity and a, and a caring element within your makeup to want to help people. Um, lots of times uh, young people have a perception of our business that it's all what they see on the news every night and it's all about the, the tragedies. Well, that's less than 1% of our business. And so it's, it's a people caring business because the non-emergency business is, is a uh, a major component of our business so it's not that you're going to be able to be on the news every night it's how you're going to hold somebody's hand how you're going to be kind to somebody and courteous and not everybody has that makeup they, they come in to it thinking that this is going to be a a, a glory job and, and it's it's a wonderful job but you've got to have feeling of heart to do it for young people considering going into any kind of business based on your experience is it becoming <clears throat> almost too hard to go into business. What would you say they really need to have in their characters to succeed in business today in this current regulated climate? Well, I, I use a term frequently that says you have to go around the block a few times. Uh, I, I just think it's impossible uh, to be able to challenge a new business venture if you have not had the experience uh, being an active part as a manager or a supervisorial employee so that you can carry that experience forward as you apply it to developing your own business. I, I purposely uh, work in my business every day and, and, and try to make new things happen, okay, because that's me. I know what it takes, but I've been there. I've been in this business 44 years now, okay, but new people have to understand the, the, the school of hard knocks. You, you've got to go around the block. You've got to have that experience. You've got to know how to deal with people uh, because people are your biggest asset. And, and uh, you know, there, there's such a thing as, as being able to 
um, collaborate and, and to be able to communicate uh, with people that you may see for the first time, knowing how to uh, impress upon them your message. You know, and you, you just can't get that out of a book. You, you've got to be able to have that experience. And, and uh, so I think having the experience, but you've got to have it from, from the heart. You've got to feel like you, want, you really are happy and you want to make something um, good happen for you or your family because that's what took me from day number one with the ambulance company was I'm happy to be here. Thank you for affording me this opportunity, City of Bakersfield, to be in business. And that's the way I carry it. Well, that's Harvey Hall, the business leader. Now we shift to... Harvey, there are many people here. You have a huge enterprise going. You're on top of uh, buried under all these regulations and demands and growing expectations. And yet you have found time in your life to become a, le a leading civic leader. Um, we go back to the bicycle parade and the building floats and suddenly here you are in charge of the Christmas parade. Tell us about that part of your life. What kept you involved in the civic side of this life, of this city and giving back at that level? Well, from the very beginning, um, when I started the company, um, the community was good to me and, and, and gave back to me in so many different ways. So as soon as I got to a point where I wasn't running every first ambulance call, then I began to see the value and how I might be able to give back to the community. And so I would take every occasion uh, to be able to get involved in a cause, get involved in, in various civic organizations because I, again, I was happy to bring my resources or to bring me as a person to be a part of making our community better. The challenge of the Christmas parade was one in which uh, I felt like the, uh, uh, the community needed a Christmas parade. It had been absent for a good number of years and and I, uh, that's my happiest day of the year is, is Christmas. And so if I could help organize a Christmas parade and bring back the, to thousands of people and families in this community, then I was going to do that. So the 18 years that we were able to do that with the help of volunteers and, and my employees, that, that was a great experience for me. Um, my, my challenge of, of um, constantly being able to, to help people is uh, currently one of my biggest challenges today, be able to help more people. That's why I wanted to be mayor. I wanted to be mayor because I felt like that I had given enough as a community activist, but I wanted to be in a position to give more. And so uh, that was the reason why I ran for mayor, was so that I could give more back to the community. And, and Bakersfield is, a, is an exceptionally caring community. So for me to be able to reach out and and, and help people and, and be a part of positive things. That's, that's uh, just a wonderful experience for me. That's a huge transition to go uh, from civic leader then into the political arena. First of all, Harvey, just tell me about the decision-making process that you went through to decide, I am going to be a candidate. Who did you consult? Uh, what, what process did you go through to reach that decision in your life? Well, my first experience in, in political life was uh, being elected as a member of the Kern Community College Board of Trustees. And I served there for year, four years, and I was encouraged by a number of the senior uh, trustee members at the time to run for an open seat. And because I thought a lot of these people, then I chose to do that, and I was successful with that election. The mayor's job was, was uh, an interesting one as far as preparation and uh, when uh, then Mayor Price chose not to seek re-election then the first person I went to talk to was Mayor Don Hart who had the reputation as, as being one of the more popular mayors uh, in the uh, uh, nearly 20 year period and I knew Don as a personal friend and so it was an easy experience for me to call upon him first and go and talk to him and because he knew me and knew what I had done uh, in my life to that point, we spent three hours one morning in his uh, Haberfeld building office and he shared with me his thoughts about how to become a good mayor and what it takes to be mayor. Pass that wisdom on. What did he tell you? He, he told me that you had to be a people person and you had to enjoy your work and you had to be in a position of being able to want to sell the city 
and, and, and sell the value of what our community was all about. And, and be willing to give of yourself. Give of yourself in every way possible so that people could be uh, uh, very receptive to your leadership. And most importantly, you said you've got to be a mayor for all quadrants of the city. And I, I have done that, and I have taken his leadership and his advice, and, and uh, that's what uh, took me to um, run for my first term as mayor is because I felt good that I could qualify and I'm happy that I'm the 25th mayor of Bakersfield of California's 11th largest city and to having been uh, reelected for a second term uh, I just continue my mission. Um, one, one of the the most important things to me about the mayor's job is that it's a positive job. Uh, I, I love being a part of the positive things that I get to do and give back. And that's why I think so much of it. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about uh, my thoughts. I, I got so excited when I first became mayor. And, and in the mayor's office, there are pictures of all the past city council members and mayors who served. So one morning, I, I didn't know this, but I went and looked on my board because it shows underneath their pictures the, the time of, of service for the city. So I wanted to go see how long the longest serving mayor had, had been in place. And, and so as it turned out, it was Don Hart who had served three, four year terms. Well, at the time I thought, I want to be the longest serving mayor. And, and, and so uh, then I figured out that I'd have to serve 16 years to do that. And so I, I've had second thoughts about that, but who knows? But I think maybe if after I serve 16 years, my people might have to wheel me in in a wheelchair every night for the city council meetings. But that was, that's been a very positive to think about that. And it's, it's been a wonderful experience for me. Harvey, I know at a personal level, uh, toward the end of your first term, there was a point of, uh, of uh, I don't know what we could call it, discouragement. You were questioning whether you wanted to go on with that kind of service. Tell us about the low points and how you bounce back from those and, and maybe a time of discouragement and how you worked your way past that obstacle. You know, um, you're absolutely right. That, that was a very uh, low point, and not only in my business career, but in my political career. But you know, because of the amount of friends and because of the amount of people that appreciated me for what I had done and what I had given, they came to me. They gave me that, that, that heart muscle that I needed to know that, you know, Harvey, you're the, you're the ambassador of this city and you, you can't let a little bit of adversity take you from us because the work that you do uh, as mayor is, is just outstanding and you're a good person and uh, you need not let people um, uh, get to you in that way because you give back so much and you're so valuable to our community and so that's that's what took me uh, through that phase but that that was a low point. I think every uh, political leader is known for one single quote that just seems to stand out from all the rest. And for you, the one that I remember is you once said that no one ever comes to Bakersfield of their own free will and no one ever leaves Bakersfield of their own free will. I just think that says so much about the uh, paradoxical nature of this city. Explain what you meant by that. Well, what, what I meant was that the, when, people, when people come here, um, they're going to enjoy themselves. When they get here, they're going to feel good. And, and as they spend time and as they reach out and, and are uh, affectionately uh, um, uh, accepted by our community, they're never going to want to leave. And uh, I, I believe that about this community. Why is there the growth that we have? It's because the, the core of Bakersfield is about each other and caring for each other. Harvey, perhaps more than any other mayor, you really are presiding over the most dramatic transition this city has ever gone through. We are going from, a, in this year 2005, from a, from a big, small town, if you will, to a, a small, big city with all its attendant problems. What, uh, what are your greatest fears for this city as we go through this transition? And we'll get to the hopes later, but your greatest concerns as we go through this enormous transition. I think that um, our transportation network, 
uh, is, is most important, that, that we must enhance uh, our roadways and, and to be able to move people um, uh, smoothly through this city. Uh, I, I know that we have great expectations for uh, recent government funding that is going to be coming our way, but as long as we uh, bring as many people to the city as we have and we're not able to move them, then that means that we're going to add to the poor air quality because they're going to have to stand in place or, or, or uh, uh, stop at stop signs for longer periods of time. I think air quality is something that the community needs to start very seriously looking at and, and cutting down on, on, the, on the amount of uh, vehicle traffic. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, we're doing a wonderful job with community development. I think that uh, we're, we're going to make strides, hopefully, uh, uh, in, in downtown redevelopment. Uh, I, I think that um, the positive things of, of, of what we need to do is just keep working with each other and, 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 and let's not, if people want to live here, we want to be able to accommodate them. Let's not look disfavorably about growth and about people wanting to come and spend money. You know, and I, I think that it's terrific that uh, our city uh, continues to enjoy single-digit unemployment. And, and that's a value of business prosperity. And uh, I, I think that uh, it's important that a community um, reach out and, and constantly see what it can do to make the quality of life better for its citizens. Harvey, I remember one of our greatest developers here said, if we simply build beautiful homes out in the southwest and let other parts of the city decay, this city will not work well. And you take pride in being the mayor of all quadrants of the city. The more affluent areas will take care of themselves, but what about those areas that are struggling and lagging behind and, and need special help to be fully integrated into the life of this city? What, what can a mayor and what can this city do for them in those areas? You know, I, I, think we're, I think we're making good study progress in that regard. Uh, I think that with the development of the Northwest and, and the Northeast, uh, there's, there's constant interest in, in the Southeast area of the city in developing new housing opportunities. Uh, if we're able to fulfill our South uh, Mill Creek project in downtown Bakersfield, I think there is a, um, uh, an attitude among developers and, and uh, uh, businesses that uh, we are reaching out. We are trying to make in every way possible affordable housing at all levels so that if people uh, are at a moderate income level and they, the, they want a nicer house, then they're able to do that. I, I think we are making strides in that regard and, and I don't think there's, there, there is going to be a long-term unmet housing need for everyone. Harvey, uh, I have to ask you this question coming from my own background. You have been uh, in the spotlight of the media. You deal with the media all the time. Any thoughts about the media and the way the media does its job? Any changes that you would like to see in the way the media does its job in covering local politics? You know, I, I think there's, there's more to uh, media reporting than the negative. And, and, I, and I think that it's... I recognize that print media and uh, video media, uh, it's all about ratings, it's all about selling newspapers. But I don't think we spend enough time on um, community service recognitions. Uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity for the media to do more with showing uh, appreciation uh, for things that happen in this community. and. You know, um, I just think that there's more to uh, media presentation than uh, homicides and traffic fatalities and government doing a poor job. You know, I, I believe in the positive, and, and I think that as, it, as the news needs to be reported, I think there should be greater emphasis placed on the positive. Harvey, one last question. If you had the opportunity to deliver the commencement address to every high school student in the, uh, gathered in one arena, uh, what, what would be the central message that you would want to leave with those high school seniors as they face their lives and move on into higher education and on into their careers? What would you tell them? Well, I would tell them that uh, you must be of high moral character, you must be a good citizen, 
and most importantly, you must be a Boy Scout and be prepared. Well, Harvey Hall, you certainly represent uh, all of those qualities, uh, so you are definitely uh, uh, walking the walk and walking the talk, and thanks for being with us. Wonderful to, wonderful to learn your, your true life. Thank you for the opportunity. And this has been a conversation with the Honorable Harvey Hall, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, and truly a life that belongs in the great biographies of Bakersfield.